We've got a couple of uh, things you want to share just before we get going. Uh, the first is um, we want to recognize uh, the great damage that has been happening um, to indigenous communities across the country and particularly to Kevin's hometown of Leighton, BC. Um, and we are going to share in the chat right now a GoFundMe campaign that we strongly encourage you to donate whatever you are able to today to help rebuild uh, this result of a climate catastrophe, which has landed on top of a health catastrophe, which has landed on top of an ongoing um, genocide. Uh, it's, uh, I think the, the best thing that we can do to support this community is to offer them the funds to, uh, to help rebuild, to help uh, manage themselves. So we hope you will do that. Also understanding that it's a very difficult time. We have dropped in the chat just now, a list of mental health resources, um, many of which are uh, targeted at First Nations, Métis and Inuit communities, and some of which are just more general resources. Um, so please prioritize your own well-being in this moment. And if you need to make use of any of these resources, um, please find them in the chat. Or you can message me directly at some time if you're like, I can't find that link. I will give it back to you. I'm very excited uh, about today's keynote and I don't wanna take up any more time before we get to it. And so I want to throw to our uh, host and uh, the moderator of our uh, Q and A, Selena. Selena, thank you very much. And please uh, have a great conference. Thanks very much, Neil. Um, hello everyone, I am so, uh, so grateful to be here uh, with you today. And uh, thank you for joining us uh, with for Kevin Loring's lecture, the keynote, keynote lecture, Returning the Page, How Theater Practice Must Bravely Return into a Post-Pandemic Decolonial and Anti-Racist World. This is the third keynote session of this year's third leg, like third, the third leg of the CATR conference. Um, just to explain to you, my name is Selena Couture. I'm a white woman in my 50s. I'm wearing a white t-shirt with an orange shirt standing in a room with lots of windows behind me. I'm a professor in the drama department at U of, U of Alberta in Treaty 6 territory, Métis region number four, Amiskachi, Wiskaigan, which is also known as Edmonton. I'm an 11th generation descendant of French settlers and a sixth generation descendant of Irish settlers who came to the eastern areas of the land currently known as Canada. And although my family has been in this land for almost 400 years, I'm still learning what it means to uh, live with this heritage and to be in respectful relation with Indigenous people and what my responsibilities are to uphold treaty and to support decolonial anti-racist uh, action. So I also need to mention my relation to the land and waters where I'm speaking from today to situate myself in, in, as I float on your screen in a rectangle. Um, and these are uh, lands and waters where I've spent most of my adult life in the unceded traditional and ancestral territories of the Hunkamidam speaking Matkoyam and Tsleil-Waututh peoples and the Squamish and Snitchin speaking Squamish peoples. Um, it's currently known as Vancouver, British Columbia. And much of what I have learned about being a respectful visitor, or in local Indigenous language, Hakaminim, uh, one who walks alongside, has been from Coast Salish people. So, for those of you who may not be familiar yet with Kevin's work, my cat might join us at some point today. He's an old deaf fellow. Um, it makes quite a lot of noise. Um, so, sorry to come back. Uh, for those of you who are not yet familiar with Kevin's work, um, this is his bio. Kevin Loring is in Klakapu from the Lytton First Nation in British Columbia. He is an accomplished actor, playwright, director, and founding director, artistic director of Savage Society, a nonprofit charity dedicated to the telling of Indigenous stories. He is currently the artistic director of Indigenous Theatre at the National Arts Centre of Canada. A versatile artist and leader, Loring has served as the co curator of the Talking Stick Festival as artistic resident at the Vancouver Playhouse and as an artistic director of the Savage Society in Vancouver. 
as a documentary producer, writer, director, and co-host of Canyon War, The Untold Story, and as the project leader, creator, and director of the Songs of the Land project in his home community of Lytton First Nation. Lauren created the Lo Songs of the Land project in 2012 in partnership with five separate community organizations. The project explores 100 year old audio recordings and the creation stories of the Inklakapu. Loring has written several new plays based on this work with an ensemble of professional Indigenous artists and community members. These include Battle of the Birds, about domestic violence and power of use, The Council of Spider, Ant and Fly, about the introduction of death into the universe, and The Boy Who Was Abandoned, about youth abandonment and elder neglect. Kevin has a long history at the National Arts Centre, as well as performing in numerous productions there. He was a company member of the National Arts Centre English Theatre Acting Company and was the playwright in residence there in 2010. Kevin is the recipient of many awards and accolades, most notably the 2009 Governor General's Literary Award for his play, Where the Blood Mixes, and a Governor General's Performing Arts Mentorship Award. And he was a GG Literary Award finalist for his play, Thanks for Giving, in 2018. And most recently, last month, June 2021, he was the recipient of an honorary doctorate from the University of Ottawa. And so just to conclude my remarks, I want to say how much Kevin's work in theatre, in all the capacities that I've mentioned in this bio, but especially as, as the first artistic director of the National Arts Centre's Indigenous Theatre, has been a gift to the Indigenous theatre community, as well as the rest of the theatre world. Administrative work can be unsung and a slog, especially in a large colonial institution, especially during a pandemic. And there is a steady persistence necessary to carry out the work that doesn't get the rush of audience appreciation and applause. But yet this work has to happen in order for the artists to get on the stage. It is both everyday mundane work and remarkable. And I also briefly want to mention how Kevin's artistic work has had an effect on how I understand the world and how it has expanded my students' perspectives as we read Where the Blood Mixes every year. And every year, there's one particular line from the play that has a huge impact. It is the line at the end of, in the final scene with Mooch and June, or Mooch, who at this point identifies his name as Edgar. Um, and he says to June when she's worried, that he might jump off the bridge, he looks at her and he tells her, I cross this bridge every day. And at this point, the strength of this character becomes crystal clear. And that despite all the hardships and the harms he's lived through, he chooses to cross the bridge every day and continue to survive. So today I'm thinking about that bridge and the strength and the resilience of characters such as Mooch and that these qualities are needed so much in our world right now on so many fronts. So um, with that, um, I wanna pass the Zoom spotlight to Kevin and uh, I welcome you, Kevin, today. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Well, that made me really emotional uh, thinking about that scene on that bridge. Uh, it's, uh, it's been quite a week for me every year. Um, uh, Dr. Kevin Loringhan Schwest. Uh, thank you for that introduction, uh, Selena. Uh, thank you, that was, um, it was great. I'm really honored to be here. Um, uh, stay up. I wanna thank the Canadian Association of Theatre Research for inviting me to be the keynote speaker uh, for this year's conference. Thank you. As I live and work in the Ottawa region, I want to begin by thanking the Algonquin Anishinaabe for their stewardship of this land. On behalf of my family, I raise my hands to you in respect and honor. We thank you for being such generous hosts and for your incredible patience and generosity with, uh, with your Timiw, your beautiful ancestral lands. Uh, I'm a mixed Indigenous uh, settler man in my 40s. I'm in, a, in my office. I have a, a small art piece behind my shoulder. It's actually from 
the original production of Where the Blood Mixes. This is actually an image of, a, of an osprey flying over the river. Um, and it was actually projected onto the set of the, uh, the very first, uh, the world premiere of Where the Blood Mixes. Um, to the organizers of this gathering. Um, before I begin, I'd like to address the elephant in the room. Uh, last week, after record shattering heat, uh, a heat wave that, that saw the hottest ever temperatures recorded in North America, my village of Lytton, BC was razed to the ground by wildfire sparked by, passing, by a passing train carrying coal down to the coast and off to the furnaces of the world. Although the cause remains officially unknown, those who live and work and raise their families in my tiny community of Lytton know what caused this fire. Uh, people witnessed it, but also every summer, BC burns. And as the temperatures have risen, BC burns more frequently. Along the train tracks in the Fraser Canyon, fires started by trains threaten communities along the corridor every summer. In the last five years, major fires started by trains have directly threatened Lytton on at least three occasions. In one instance, a wildfire nearly burned down a house where I had housed a team of artists for our community show. One might think that the frequency of disastrous fires, with the frequency of disastrous fires, the railroads might approach the summer season more cautiously. Unfortunately, that is not the case. So on a day when Lytton was hotter than Saudi Arabia, a full schedule of trains was running at capacity in 50 degree heat that had been baking the town for days. The fire was sparked at the south end of town in an area known locally as Hobo's Hollow. It took 23 minutes to engulf the entire town and nearby reserves, 23 minutes. A couple in their 60s didn't make it. And my heart goes out to the families of those that, that lost their lives. My own family barely made it out alive. The stories are terrifying and harrowing. My community, my family, is spread out across the province. Many are now homeless, living in hotels and evac centers, campgrounds, and community halls. My family home my mother's home, and many of my uncles and aunts and cousins' homes have all been lost. I have spent the last week frantically trying to help from afar. We've pushed the limits of my company's charitable activities to allow us to help in any way we can. We've turned my little theater company into a micro NGO, organizing and delivering donations of goods to those affected and on the front lines of the fire and raising money to support the survivors in the aftermath of this deadly blaze. I bring the reality of this calamity to this conversation because it is the context under which I am here today. This is my reality. My community, my entire family are climate refugees here. Now, not in some far off country, but in Canada today. Environmental racism, like systemic racism, is insidious. It feels like it's just the way things are until you dig a little deeper. Just under the surface, you realize <clears throat> that it doesn't have to be so, that it boils down to choices and priorities. Who matters? It is ironic in a way that the train that lit the fire that burned down my community on the hottest day ever recorded in North America, perhaps the hottest temperatures in North America in a thousand years, if the climate scientists are to be believed. It's ironic that this was a coal train destined to feed the industrial furnaces of the world. Priorities. So that's where I'm coming from today. 
that's what I'm trying to carry while I am here participating in this conversation with you. We are taught in theater school often to leave all of our baggage at the door when entering the space. We are in the room together to create and play and perform only after having left our troubles outside of the space. I don't think this is in fact possible. I think that we, what we are really saying is don't burden everyone else with your whole selves. We are here to work. But when our work is our whole selves, how are we to work? The same dynamic exists for racialized artists as well. Our whole selves are often in danger or are being diminished by systemic situations that make us other. And that reality is what I want to address with my remarks today. We've been enduring an incredibly stressful and dangerous time as we collectively navigate the COVID-19 global pandemic. That is what we collectively come to the room today with. And none of us are under any illusions that this reality affects our present selves, our ability to engage with the work at hand. When the lockdown orders hit, I had just returned from Australia to visit Western Australia as I was invited to attend the Perth Festival to see the Indigenous work being presented there and to meet some of the industry folks down under. A week after returning home from literally traveling across the globe, our world came to a halting shutdown. The weeks that followed were chaotic and filled with dread and disbelief as the previous two years of work building the new Indigenous Theatre Department and launching our first season came crashing down. The remainder of our season was cancelled. The months of work leading up to the imminent launch of our follow-up season evaporated. Years of establishing vital international connections with Indigenous artists around the world and across Turtle Island went into hibernation. And we were left scrambling to disassemble all that we had been carefully building for over two and a half years. We then immediately and simultaneously made the pivot to digital. The cancellation of all these shows across the country hit artists hard. So we did what we could to leverage our positions and our platforms to present artists and get money into their hands. We went from planning three years out to planning and unplanning in three month cycles. For most of the year, we struggled to find ways to do work in the theater any way possible and at every opportunity, only to be shut down and eventually locked out. This became exhausting and demoralizing as the pandemic raged on. This awful virus not only attacks our bodies, but has laid waste so, to so much of our norm, to, to so much of norm our, of our social structures pushing us into isolation and, and forcing us to disconnect from each other in order to protect ourselves. It has killed so many and injured more. And we're all in this together because all my relations, because if the great teacher that is the pandemic has taught us anything, it's that we are all connected, all my relations. The pandemic has brought me a whole new understanding of what that great indigenous hallelujah is. For those of you who don't know, all my relations is a kind of like uh, an indigenous hallelujah or amen. I was taught that all my relations works on a couple of levels. On the one hand, it means on behalf of my relations. That is on behalf of my family. At the same time, it means to all of whom I'm in relation with. That means you, the guy serving me coffee, everyone standing in line at the grocery store, even the crow on the telephone wire calling at me as I walk down the street. It means all of my relations, perceived or not perceived, those whom I have an effect upon without even knowing it, that they may be blessed too, and to, carry, and to be carried in our thoughts. It is a blessing that asks us to ultimately acknowledge all of creation in our thoughts, 
because we are all related as the children of Mother Earth, as beings in this universe, as interrelated units of this great collective consciousness we call humanity. Because although we are related in this way, we are also mostly ignorant of each other. That's why we need representation, to be relieved of the ignorance of the illusion of homogeneity. To have those other differing perspectives reflected into the consciousness of our communities, to counter the ever-increasing echo chambers of our daily existence as thinking empathic beings traveling together around the sun in concentric, galactic, universal circles at this time in this place. It has been an absolutely devastating time for artists and art organizations as our entire industry is built upon the hosting of mass gatherings. But now, mass gatherings, not only dangerous, but illegal. <laughs> not only that, but of course, many artists rely on the service industry to supplement their artistic careers. And with that industry also being devastated, it is only added to the challenges artists had to endure. I want to raise my hands at this time in honor and respect to all the artists and arts organizations that have been trying to keep the creative fires burning through this awful, absurd time. Cook, stay up for your perseverance. I would also like to take this time to raise my hands in honor with the highest respect and regard for the frontline workers and health workers who've been battling this pandemic directly and supporting us all with their work. Cook, stay up, we thank you. We're so grateful for you. This pandemic has been a teacher. It has taught us so much. It has shown what we are capable of and incapable of. It has revealed what we need and what we take for granted. It has put a spotlight on the inequities of our society and shown us what and who is truly essential. And in that examination of what is or isn't necessary, art remains an undeniably essential component of our daily lives. Art has helped us get through. And for that, we must be so grateful for art and the artists who create. What would this time have been like without art? Can you even imagine with no books or movies, music, or online play readings to help us through. <laughs> when there is no one there to comfort us, art remains. Art is there to hold our hands, to inspire our spirits while we wait out this viral storm raging around us. Artists are a resilient and innovative bunch, and art finds a way. Artists are no stranger to struggle. And in spite of it all, the need to create and the need to consume art remains, even increases the harder things are. But these times are extraordinary. And what we have seen is a real need for support for artists as a working class. My job at the National Art Center during this time has really been about getting as many resources to as many artists as possible. With the tools of the age, we have pivoted to digital. We've created work that doesn't require a venue, that is designed to embrace physical distancing and still keep us connected. Where possible, we perform physically distanced in the outdoors or in carefully regulated and sanitized spaces. Artists have been singing from sidewalks to household audiences standing on their porches. They dance on the land and rehearse and record in cyber spaces. This is of course no substitute for in the flesh live reality, but when there is no other option, we have learned to make do. We all long to be able to return to the theater, to enjoy the brilliance of artists, to hear a concert or a play or a dance show, or to get up on the dance floor ourselves and move to the music with a crew of our best friends. But what I think is remarkable about this, that without venues, art has been forced to return to the streets. 
public spaces, to community. The global pandemic comes at a time when we are also reckoning as a society with systemic racism and colonialism. The theater is still such a powerful medium for the expression of these subjects. Many of our most celebrated plays speak of the inequities and the struggles within our society. And yet in so many ways, voices of color have been excluded and overlooked, ignored or ghettoized by many of the larger institutions since forever. The cultural infrastructure of Canada was built on an ideological foundation of nation building following the Second World War at a time before the doctrines of multiculturalism and inclusion had any influence or penetration into our daily ethos. So these institutions were created at a time when Canada was still very, very white. At a time when to be indigenous meant you couldn't even leave the reserve to come into town without a signed pass card from the local Indian agent, or you would end up in jail. If it therefore might stand to reason that the tradition of theater in this country is rooted predominantly in white society. Our institutions have been built to nurture a white audience at the exclusion of most others. Marketing departments often struggle to penetrate any community other than the dominant white audience base that they are familiar with because that is typically the community that those departments belong to. So when those works come to the stage, outreach for some theaters ends up entailing thrusting some poor jet lagged indigenous playwright onto a five minute spot at 7 a.m. on the morning show to discuss their neat new play about injustice and inequality. Not that that's so bad. It's great to be on a morning show. It's just so early in the morning, we can do better. We can do the work of making relationships with those communities we have no relationship with, but who've literally always been there. By doing the work of welcoming folks to our spaces, and that's what we need to do. Sometimes I feel like we've come a long way in a short time at the NAC Indigenous Theater. And then I realized we didn't even get through our first season before the apocalypse hit. So much groundwork went into its creation and so much care. We were interrupted by the pandemic and that sucks. But people are dying. Things are serious. And we will make do. And do what we can. I've had my second shot for more than two weeks now. So my 5G is killer. And I can't wait to see, start seeing art up close and personal again. Now, the NEC is the crown jewel of the Canadian Regional Theatre Network, either by default or by design, depending on who you ask. Created out of the recommendations following the Massey Commission on National Development of the Arts, Letters and Sciences, the NAC is a crown corporation created to celebrate Canadian performing art and artists. The Massey Commission, written at the height of the residential school system around 1949 to 51, and out of which came the creation of the Canada Council for the Arts and the building of the NAC, said this about Native art. Chapter 15, Section 4. Since the death of true Indian arts is inevitable, Indians should not be encouraged to prolong the existence of arts, which at best must be artificial and at worst degenerate. It is argued that Indian arts emerge naturally from that combination of religious practices and economic and social customs, which con constituted the culture of the tribe and region. The impact of the white man with his more advanced civilization and his infinitely superior techniques resulted in the gradual destruction of the Indian way of life. The Indian arts this survive only as ghosts or shadows of a dead society. They can never, it is said, regain real form or substance. Indians with creative talent should therefore develop it as other Canadians do and should receive every encouragement for this purpose. But Indian art as such 
cannot be revived. This entire chapter of the Massey paper is directed towards indigenous art and culture and was a foundational document of the Canadian cultural and artistic economy. It is boldly paternalistic, racist, and ignorant of indigenous peoples. This paper is an ideological pillar from which the creation of the Canadian art infrastructure, the institutions from funding bodies to theaters, museums, and galleries have been built from. This is the legacy that we need to examine and reimagine because this legacy of racism remains. What all arts institutions reflect is a colonial hierarchy. They are by definition corporate and bureaucratic. And so one has to ask, are colonial corporate bureaucratic spaces safe for indigenous people? So the challenge then is how do you make the space less colonial, corporate and bureaucratic? And the answer has to be through relationships. Coming out of the pandemic, our theater spaces not only have to be safe and sanitary, they have to be welcoming and culturally safe to all of us. And to even begin to address this, we have to examine the roles that our institutions play in maintaining white supremacy in our society. Many, if not all institutions in this country are not safe or inviting places for indigenous people. Theaters are among those spaces that have not been very inviting to indigenous people. There is often little to no relationship with the indigenous communities upon whose lands our theaters occupy. I once had an artistic director from a large regional theater when asked about whether he had done any outreach towards a native housing complex down the street from his theater where my play about residential school survivors was running, reply, oh, those people don't come to the theater. Well, if that's the attitude, why the fuck would they? The way that theater is disseminated is exclusive and it is unnecessarily so. Financial barriers to physical barriers to cultural barriers and yes, racial barriers are ensuring our theaters serve a particular clientele. Investment is needed by all of our institutions to make access to the work more democratic and embracing of people outside of the typical white affluent class that theaters disproportionately serve. I'm not saying to reject the typical theater audience or subscriber base. All I'm saying is broaden your horizons, open your doors to other communities in your city and make them welcome. But also as a publicly funded enterprise, theaters must be obligated to, or else all this talk about how sore we are and how terrible it is that systemic racism exists is just bullshit. Art plays such an important role in not just entertaining us, but also in reflecting the social condition. Artists have always taken as their source material, our value sets as a society and played into or against those values in the creation of their work. I would argue that the entire canon of indigenous theater is comprised of works that engage with some form of social, political, personal and or spiritual struggle against settler colonialism. My own work as a playwright either engages directly with those impacts or attempts to work in a way that, it, that to counter those impacts. Indigenous artists reckon with our histories every single day just like Mooch crossing that bridge. We are constantly reminded of it. We use it in our work because it needs to be wrestled with, understood, challenged. Our identities position us in opposition to the colonial projects of Canada. Not because we want to be in opposition, but because we must be. Our lands are occupied and exploited while we remain impoverished, left out and neglected. Our children are in care. Our communities struggle. As it is in our communities, so too has it been in the city. We have so much to work through and against just to be heard, to be seen. And when we are seen, it has rarely been on our terms. 
Western film and television industry, the Western film and television industry was built on the glorification of the genocide of the Americas and the exotification and denigration of black, Asian and indigenous cultures. The tourist industry celebrates indigenous art while security guards bully street associated indigenous people off the sidewalks in tourist traps all across this country. We are told by the political class that no other relationship is more important. As the RCMP remove elders from roadblocks, punch chiefs in parking lots, and send snipers to oversee peaceful protesters protecting their ancestral territory from pipelines and logging. We are apologized to and commiserated with in public while court cases against residential school survivors and child advocates continue and on and on and on. Yet people keep telling me how so much is changing. But is it really? I hope, fingers crossed, won't hold my breath. When nothing has changed for so long, any change feels irrevocable and definitive. Amidst all of the goodwill and the things are different now, nods of confidence I've received having been elevated to a position of equal power to my white peers. I'm not convinced things have changed, either for better or worse. People are beginning to see us now though, I think. I'm not sure, but I think. And they are beginning, just beginning, to allow themselves to see us not for who they would like us to be, but who we say we are. And that has taken a long, long time. It's not much, but it's a start. Maybe even a new beginning. And yet so many of the stories we choose to tell are indigenous per person encounters legacies of trauma from settler colonialism and struggles to navigate the toxic outcomes associated with it. That is basically the logline of almost every indigenous play ever written. Prove me wrong. It makes sense. It's not a bad thing. I certainly enjoy doing it. But it's interesting to me that the difference of energy and the kind of work that comes out when I'm working in my community with our rhythms and language and way of being outside of the black box, in the wind and the weather, in a sparse hall with my theater and my community family together, feeding each other culture and language and stories one berry at a time. I find that when I work in the theater, and this is true of my own work and the work of other indigenous playwrights, the plays are most often a reflection of the settler colonial indigenous dynamic. For sure, right? Who typically goes to the theater? White people. So we aim that work at that audience. Here, maybe this will penetrate. Boom, we get dry lips right, out, right in the face from Thompson Highway. Then Marie Clump, Marie, Marie Clements comes along and blows our minds with indigenous fourth dimensional dramaturgy. But I also wonder if it's because of the space itself, the institution of theater and the very buildings we do theater in, and perhaps our opposition to those structures was leaking out onto the stage. But things are changing here too. Artists are decolon decolonializing their decolonizing how oh, that word. Artists are decolonizing their practices and not playing the regular theater games. Many are beginning to reject the unions and associations that steward the professional theater ecology because they've felt abused and infringed upon by the way the system of fees have negatively impacted artists of color in particular. One of the huge things that I've been party to alongside my cousin and colleague, Laurie Marchand, managing director of Indigenous Theatre, was our involvement in the new CTA and the almost two year long negotiations between PACT and Equity for this new agreement. Our involvement has led directly to the creation of two new clauses within the CTA. Article 10, the acknowledgement that the CTA, CTA has been a racist and discriminative document 
and that both parties would work to ensure that it no longer remained so. And the creation of the provision to allow artists who work in community settings and in, uh, in, in particular in undeserved communities are not ob obliged to sign an equity form of contract or pay fees to the association for that work. And the definition with the CTA of what constitutes community engaged practices. Now don't get me wrong, I love theaters. I love working in theaters. I like to think of them as instruments that we all collectively play together, like a giant guitar or piano of ideas held between audience and company. Each has its own special quirks and characteristics, personalities even. And in the playing together, a theater emerges. But without us playing together, it's just an empty room. Our collective presence and the attention make the theater, not the room. Having been exiled from these fabulous dark rooms during this pandemic and having to pivot to alternative spaces to do the work has made me re-examine the role those spaces have in the way that performing arts have been shaped and disseminated. Obviously site-specific and non-venue work is not new or innovative in and of itself. We've been doing that since the dawn of time. But the creation of the artistic infrastructure has prioritized work in these spaces to the point where the vast majority of the resources allocated to the arts goes to supporting these structures and not to the artists themselves. And this is a problem and one that artists have been pointing out for some time. We pay the front of house staff, marketing departments, crews, departmental heads and managers salaries, or at the very least, hourly wages to maintain these temples of art. But the artists themselves are left to grind away precariously from gig to gig with often little or no support to keep their heads above water beyond project-based funding. It is their existence that we rely on most. We need the artists to be supported to create the works that we love so much. Now, I'm not an economist that there has to be a way to ensure artists are supported in a way that allows them to focus on their work rather than to be stressed about survival. The job of the artist is to dream and to take those dreams and create worlds for us to enter into. The labor is underappreciated. And because of that, the safety of the artist is always at stake, placing them at the bottom of the priority hierarchy. Perhaps the pandemic has finally taught us also that these artists deserve some form of basic income support. The pandemic has also made me think about how and where we allow ourselves to create and share. The typical proscenium structure of most theaters implies yet another hierarchy. It imposes the fourth wall along with all the other walls of the stage and an elevated relationship between artists and audience. It also insists upon one directional relationship between the players and the audience and demands that the relationship between players adhere along a singular forward-facing plane of delivery. I really appreciate open spaces and black box theaters where you can configure the space to your needs. Space is designed to easily accommodate playing in a variety of configurations beyond the missionary of proscenium are so exciting to me. Of course, they come with their own challenges, but in those challenges are added dimensions of movement and relationship. So go ahead, build some more of those theaters. I like them, please and thank you. Because in my humble opinion, they are inherently decolonial, or at least at the very least, less colonial, because they can accommodate a circle. Spaces like Dabajmajig on Malatuna Island, these versatile little theater spaces should be built all over the country, fully funded and supported by our funding institutions. They should be artist and community centric and run by small, a small administrative team guided by indigenous artists that would be, that would be a radical rethinking of the regional theater model. Indigenous culture exists within circle. And indigenous artists must be given the tools they need to create in the way that they work 
and in spaces that make it easy for indigenous audiences to be engaged. This constellation of small venues and regions across the country from coast to coast to coast could become cultural hubs for their region. With new work, where new work can be encouraged and developed and the forms of expression most favored by the communities can be nurtured and disseminated. When I do work in my community, I work in circles. When we do work in theaters, we do blocking. When we are in a circular relationship, we find ourselves contained within an infinite curve where all the directions meet. In a circle, we are equals, where no one, where, where no one point has a hierarchy over another. Sometimes it feels like indigenous theater artists are trying to fit circles into squares. And the truth is they are. And the institutions are reflexively always trying to square the circles we are building. And what we need to do is find alignment or we need to have our own spaces, to create and share our work. Another one of the things the pandemic interrupted for me was my community project. Ash Iklam Ad Mihu, Songs of the Land project. The work I've been creating with my community based on spectacular stories, Inklakatmuk creation or foundational stories. These stories reflect an Inklakatmuk cosmology, laws and values. I write short 45 minute musicals with a community comprised of, with a company comprised of Intlkatma community members and professional indigenous artists. Some of the songs are inspired by wax cylinder recordings made over a hundred years ago of Intlkatma singing their greatest and oldest hits. The stories themselves are thousands of years old. We put our spin on them as all storytellers do with a shoestring aesthetic we build and rehearse the plays over the course of a month and present it once or twice for the community for free. The narratives are in They reference an in cosmology and they are entirely compelling, accessible and universal. It might not be professional, but certainly professionals are involved. But our audiences are moved to laugh and cry and that is all we can hope for. This work is founded on a value set that places a connection to community at the center of the process, not outside of it to be drawn in through the magic of marketing. It's a process that includes the land and our history on it. The animals who live upon it with us are seen as relational. We talk about the land in the room the fish, the animals, and our relationship with those beings, the changing seasons, and the places on our lands where these stories come from. The land is embedded in the dramaturgy of the work, not as a self-conscious concept that we are forcing into the process, but because it just is. And that awareness of place, of land, relationship, roots the work and finds its expression in rhythm and movement, language, pace, and tone. We take care of each other, feed each other, share and teach each other without hierarchy without hierarchy so much as guidance. It is an indigenous process embedded with Inflakatmuk values, reflecting an Inflakatmuk worldview to a kaleidoscopic indigenous and non-indigenous audience, but an audience that is familiar with the place and the people. It is from the community for the community. It is culturally specific and yet entirely universal and can be staged on any of our finest theaters across the country. 
This project was primarily meant to engage the community and is therefore not so focused on product as one might find in a commercial setting. The emphasis is on engagement, learning and sharing rather than product and sales. The product is compelling nonetheless, compelling theater because it is authentic and relatable. These thousand year old stories are as epic as anything Shakespeare invented or that the Greeks staged. And that a self, and that's not a self-inflating comment about my own clumsy writing, but about the stories themselves. They're brilliant and very, very ancient. In my 20 plus years of being a theater practitioner, this project is the purest theater I have done. It doesn't take place in a venue, but it could. We do it with cardboard costumes and a will to have fun and take care of each other while we do it. I've been in many rehearsal halls as a professional where nowhere near as much openness, bravery, safety, and generosity were present in the room. I believe that connection to the communities we serve is the work theaters need to take more seriously coming out of this pandemic. Theaters must build relationships with the broader community beyond their usual subscriber base. They need to create relationships with a broader range of audiences than has traditionally been prioritized. And of course, the work on the stage needs to reflect that pivot. Perhaps it's my artistic upbringing, coming of age as an artist in Vancouver in the 2000s and a lack of spaces for emerging companies forced us to get inventive with space and our relationship with audience and community. But just as we've become innovative with navigating the pandemic with Zoom readings and videos, the return to the stage should be accompanied by a return to the communities our stages serve. We need to turn our institutions inside out and upside down. We need to make them accessible financially as well as physically. Make them safe and inviting to people from all cultures and not exclusive entrenched bastions of white elitism. We must insist that they are welcoming spaces for black, indigenous and other people of color and safe spaces for LGBTQ plus, two plus folks in this country. And we need to make them accessible for people of all economic needs. We're subsidized to the ceilings for Christ's sake. We should be making these public spaces public. And that means representation on the stage and within the halls of the institutions. We need to break down the barriers that have been so carefully constructed to reflect a white world to a kaleidoscopic community. And you do that by bringing those kaleidoscopic perspectives into the institutions themselves. It is not enough to just have representation on the stage requires there be, <clears throat> pardon me, representation in artistic leadership of the institutions that present the work. That involves an honest examination of the realities our institutions reflect in the first place. If we're truly serious about addressing these issues and not just reflexively making hollow gestures fueled by guilt and remorse at watching black men being murdered by cops on the news, or by the steadily increasing body count of indigenous children buried in mass graves on old residential school grounds, we need to do the hard work of reshaping our institutions from the foundations on up, or from the top down if necessary, or from the inside out, or from the upside down and around the corner, you know, by any means necessary. The social issues we are engaged with today are issues that we have been yelling and screaming, litigating, investigating, singing and making art about since the beginning of Canada. That takes the brutal reality of a knee on the neck, the horror show of, uh, of a video, of the heckling of, of the nursing staff, of a dying indigenous mother in a hospital. It takes the physical proof of all the stories we've been telling about mass graves on residential school grounds to finally and forensically prove the extent of the state-sponsored atrocities against Indigenous children and for people to finally see the reality of white supremacy in our society. It is alive and well here and now, and not in some long ago time, 
removed from our collective responsibility or somewhere south of the 49th parallel. And it has been embedded into all of our institutions from their inception, whose function has been to uphold and protect it. That work, I hope, is beginning. At the very least, the conversations are being had within the Canada Council, the National Arts Centre, the National Gallery. But what is needed for all publicly funded institutions to do the work, the deep work of identifying their role in upholding systemic racism and white supremacy and identifying what they are doing to uproot it. And to do that, you gotta get your root digging stick because what is needed is an examination of the roots of our institutions. And if it needs to be uprooted, then we have to dig it up and replant something else. The way we fund art and which art gets funded has played a role. The lack of representation within the institutions that disseminate, disseminate art plays a role. How those institutions are staffed plays a role. How they are built physically plays a role. Who they are and aren't serving at all also plays a role. We need to leave our hallowed castles and step onto the land. We need to reach out to the communities we are mandated to serve. No theater company in Canada has the mandate to tell stories only about and for white people. Yet, that is what many theaters have been getting away with doing for decades. The bureaucracies and structures within buildings resist change and are fundamentally preoccupied with their authority and continued relevance. The structures themselves reflect their origins, so too do the organizations housed within them. The NAC is the crown jewel of the Canadian Regional Theater Network. Well, I think I've I don't know if I said this one or not. <laughs> no editing. I'm sorry, just give me a sec. There we go. We need to undo this harm. We need to re reach back to the origin story of the Canadian cultural economy and the institutions that serve it. This is where the work needs to begin, with a reimagining of the foundational principles of our arts infrastructure. The inclusion of Indigenous theatre at the NAC is a beginning, as are other initiatives in other institutions, such as the appointment of the Indigenous curator at the National Gallery and some of the restructuring happening at the Canada Council for the Arts, like creating Knowing and Sharing, which is the separate stream of funding for Indigenous work. You know, it's, it's always so ironic to me that the seminal Canadian play, what is widely regarded as the seminal Canadian play is The Ecstasy of Rita Jo. George Riga's revolutionary play for its time, featuring a largely Indigenous cast, except of course for the lead role. It premiered at the opening of the National Arts Centre in 1969 with Frances Highland, a white actress, uh, as the title role of Rita Jo, telling the tragic story of the very systemic racism expressed towards the indigenous people in the Massey paper. You all know the story. This is after all the Canadian Association of Theatre Researchers. So you must also know that it took another 22 years after the premiere of Rita Jo for the first ever indigenous authored play I Lips Out of the Caput's Casing by Thompson Highway to play at the National Arts Center in 1991, 1969 to 1991. And another 15 years after that, for Marie Clemence's Copper Thunderbird in 2006 to play there, the first play written by an indigenous woman to grace the national stage, 2006. The first play directed by an Indigenous person ever to grace the stages of the NEC was the 40th anniversary production of The Ecstasy of Rita Jo in 2009, directed by Yvette Nolan. It took 40 years for the NEC to stage its first ever play directed by an Indigenous artist, ever. And the play was The Ecstasy of Rita Jo. <laughs> How many ironies? Anyways. 
Peter Hinton must be acknowledged for making it a priority to include an Indigenous play in every season of his tenure as Artistic Director of English Theatre at the NAC. With more Indigenous plays presented on the national stage during his six-year tenure than the entire previous 36 years before. It is without a doubt his decision to make Indigenous work a priority that led to the creation of the department that I now run. A decision that came with some pushback, but ultimately his artistic and moral bravery led to his predecessor, my colleague, Jillian Kiley, to also be compelled to address the lack of representation of Indigenous stories on the national stage. Also the work that was done on the Northern scene and the Indigenous scene festivals brought so much exposure to a new generation of Indigenous artists. English theatre held the summit, a gathering in Banff to discuss issues around Indigenous representation in the theatre, and the study, a three-week retreat held by English theatre, where Indi Indigenous theatre artists from all across the country gathered on Manitoulin Island to discuss and examine the Indigenous canon. Out of the study came the conclusion and a proposal that Indigenous theatre was a neglected body of work that deserved its own department at the National Arts Centre, led by Indigenous artists to present Indigenous works on the national stage as an integral part of the Crown Corporation's annual operations. This ultimately resulted in my appointment here and our inaugural season in 2019-20. Uh, Indigenous theater history, of course, also exists in relationship to important cultural, social, and political inciting events and contexts within global and national events and their impact on Indigenous relations. In 1991, the year Dry Lips was on stage at the NAC was the Oak Crisis, with two of the actors, Graham Green and Gary Farmer, who are Mohawk. In 2003, when Marie Clement's Burning Vision played at the NAC as part of the inaugural Magnetic North Theater Festival, we had the first SARS global pandemic, which of course is another coronavirus. In 2009, when my play Where the Blood Mixes opened at Magnetic North Theater Festival held in Vancouver, Stephen Harper made the historic apology for the atrocities of the residential school system in the House of Commons on the very same day we opened the fest at the festival. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the Call to Action also contributed directly to the ethos around the creation of the Indigenous Theatre Department at the NAC. The social movements, Idle and More, spurred an awakening of Indigenous art and activism. Today, Black Lives Matter challenges institutions and authority to uphold racial justice. And right now, as the body count of Indigenous children buried on residential school grounds and mass graves grows with every passing week, the Every Child Matters movement calls us all to embrace Indigenous children in particular and children of all races and ethnicities to be cared for and protected by the institutions and authorities charged with their care and to remember and honor the struggles of the residential and day school survivors. The inquiry into murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls comes 30 years after Thompson bravely grappled with the issue of misogynistic violence against Indigenous women and girls with dry lips out of move the cap as casing when it first premiered at Kathmarai in 1989. The work of the LGTQ2S plus community has always had a home in the theater world, which has arguably been a relatively safe place for queer artists and expression. But even here, transphobia and gender violence can exist and we must always be vigilant to ensure the safety of everyone, no matter their pronouns or gender identities. Our culture is kaleidoscopic, not monolithic. And our institutions have to not just reflect, but protect the beautiful rainbow of diversity. In our audience, if our audience is mostly or all white, it's not because those people don't go to the theater. It's because they have no reason to. It's because the theater hasn't been a safe place for them. It's because we haven't welcomed them in. It's because it's not art and culture. Art is culture and the audience is community. And we haven't done a very good job for either artists or audiences because we didn't find ways to embrace a broader range of people within the communities we are serving. That requires relationships and that's hard work. Theaters exist within communities, physically occupying spaces in cities and towns. 
The theater exists in a liminal space, somewhere between audience and actors, playwrights and directors, stage managers and producers. And in the professional world, also between marketers, bloggers, funders, and donors. To be anti-racist, to be gender inclusive, to be truly accessible, theater must think outside the theater. Theater needs to break through not just the fourth wall, but all the walls. A living theater must live in the community, must be a vital part of that community, something to be celebrated and take it for granted, to be a common part of the culture of the community. Audiences don't come to the theater to be ushered in to worship the proscenium and then ushered out. They come to be moved. They come to be shaken and transformed, challenged, to be taken for a ride on a journey and investigation to have their minds blown and their hearts opened up. And yes, to be entertained, to enjoy themselves, to enjoy the artists and the stories told. That's part of it too. But they also come to be in the same space together, to laugh together, to cry together, to recognize something of themselves in the work, even if it's just how much they disagree with it. And it is our responsibility to make sure that the theater is a safe place for people to experience dangerous and delightful stories. Ultimately, audiences come to experience empathy and connection and to travel down paths they never would have been capable of on their own. We come to the theater to breathe with each other. And now, we all know how very vital and precious and dangerous that can be. I hope we can all find ourselves there again in a good way. Thank you, my friends. Oh, my.